to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the elders in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Acts chapter 20, verse number 32. We welcome you to our study of Paul's message to the elders in Ephesus and the continuation of the spread of the gospel in Acts chapters 20 through 22. We hope you'll get your Bible and that you'll stay tuned as we study this section together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 20, we now are going to see Paul taking of the Lord's Supper with Christians in the first century. And I want you to notice what a powerful aspect and teaching this is about the Lord's Supper. And friend, one of the things we specifically learn is in the midst of discouragement and temptation, Christians have got to keep pressing forward with their faithfulness to the Lord. Notice Acts chapter 20, and I want you to notice the context beginning in about verse number 1. The Bible says, after the uproar, that's in chapter 19 in Ephesus, after the uproar ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now we had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words. He came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria... He decided to return through Macedonia. And so Peter of Berea accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead, waiting for us at Troas. Now watch this. When we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas, Troas where we stayed seven days. Now verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Here we've got Christians assembling together on the first day of the week, on Sunday, to remember the Lord's death and to worship Almighty God. 
Friend, we often think about the Lord's Supper, and we know that is such a significant event. Jesus instituted it in Matthew chapter 26 at the Passover. Jesus brought into effect and taught about the upcoming of the Lord's Supper, which would be in the kingdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Matthew chapter 26. And in preparation for that, Jesus trained and taught his disciples how to do that acceptably with the proper elements. Jesus taught them about the unleavened bread, which he said, you know, this is my body of the new covenant. Uh, it is shed for you. He talked about his blood, which represented the new covenant as well, and which would be given for the forgiveness of sins and how those elements were to be done in remembrance of him. Paul mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But one of the questions that often arises is, how often do Christians partake of the Lord's Supper? Friend, we need to look no further than the teaching of the New Testament in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we are again told, On the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. They're, part of the major purpose in them coming together was to remember the Lord's death through the Lord's Supper. How, when did they do that? On the first day of the week. Now, friend, what particular week is in mind here? There is no specific, unique week in mind. Well, here's another question. Why did they do it on the first day of the week? Well, Jesus arose on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is significant. It's found here in Scripture as authorized. And how many weeks? How many weeks have a first day? Well, what's going on here? Are they doing this once a month? Are they doing this on Christmas and an Easter, as sometimes we see in our world today? Friend, listen carefully. Every week, has a first day. They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. Friend, let me think about this with you for just a moment. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, if we can find out how often Christians assemble on the first day of the week, and, and if we can see some other language that's used relative to this in the New Testament, it'll help us also to understand this. Let me give you another example. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. The Bible says that they came together on the first day of the week, and their purpose here is to give, but they came together every first day of the week. The word kata is there used, representative of every first day of the week. They were to lay by in store. Now, Christians came together every first day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7, a big part of that was to break bread. And so you've got Christians coming together every first day of the week. That is part of, to partake of, the Lord's Supper. Friend, why is it that sometimes people just take the Lord's Supper once a month, or Christmas and Easter? That, that's not what you find in the Bible. In the Scriptures, Christians came together on the first day of every week. In Acts 20, verse 7, we learn part of that was to break bread. Now, let me use uh, some familiar language in the Bible, Old Testament, that I think will help us to understand this. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, God is here commanding about the Sabbath. And I know we're not, we're not under the Sabbath today. The old law has been nailed to the cross, Ephesians 2, 14 and 15, and Colossians 2, 14 and 15. But here's some similar language that will help us to understand the command of Acts 20, verse 7. In Exodus 20, verse 8, God said this, Remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. How did the Jews interpret that? What was it? Sabbath was Saturday. Are you talking about one Saturday out of the year, God? Are you talking about a special Saturday here and there, first Saturday of the month? How do they understand that phrase, remember the Sabbath? Here's how. Every Saturday that rolled around, every Sabbath that came, they remembered it as holy. Now you parallel that with the language of Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week. What first day of the week? Every 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. Christians are to remember and partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. That's the biblical pattern. Friend, there's no authority in the Scripture for taking it once a month or taking it on Christmas and Easter. The pattern that we see in Acts 20, verse 7 is they came together on the first day of the week to break bread. If that's what they did, friend, isn't that what Christians today should do as well? Let's also remember this. 
part of Paul's work as a gospel preacher was to give people the full teaching of God's Word and to never hold back the whole counsel of Almighty God. I want you to notice Acts chapter 20, verse number 20. The scripture records this. Paul speaking in Ephesus to the elders says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful for you, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Now notice verse number 28. Paul says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. A part of their work was to spread that message. And then verse 27, Paul says, I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Friend, just because it may not be popular, just because it may not always fit people's lifestyles, or it might rub people the wrong way, doesn't mean we can hold back preaching the gospel. Paul said to the evangelist Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because time will come and they'll not endure sound doctrine. They'll take up for themselves teachers uh, who will tickle their ears in essence, Paul will say, but you continue in it. Friend, we've got to stand four square, preach the word of God, and stand for the truth as we find it in the Bible. You see, Paul said this is how you become innocent of the blood of all men. Paul said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. How, Paul? I've not shunned declared to you the whole counsel of God. Now, friend, if, that, if preaching the whole counsel makes us innocent of the blood of all men, what's preaching part of it do? What is just bits and pieces makes us guilty, does it not? Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel 33, we see the, the enemy coming. We don't sound the trumpet. We don't tell. We play the silent partner in essence. God says... I'm going to require His blood at your hand. Now, if we teach the whole gospel and we teach what God says and people die in their sins, God says you're not guilty of their blood. Our responsibility is to teach the whole truth and nothing but the truth of God's Word. Now, let's make another practical application and this specifically relates to elders in the Lord's church today. God has designed for there to be elders in every congregation. Acts chapter 20, verse 17, and Titus chapter 1, verse 5. God wants elders to be the spiritual leaders in the congregation, shepherds under Christ who are trying to fulfill the ultimate will of God. Qualifications are given in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, but a big part of their work is this. Shepherds must heed to the Word of God, stay closely in line with the teaching of the Bible, they must feed the flock the Word of God. They must make sure that God's Word is taught and they've got to lead them in that direction. I want you to notice again Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Look at how Paul says this, this to the elders. Paul says, Therefore, to the elders in Ephesus, take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Friend, the work of an elder is a very serious responsibility. They are watching out for people's souls. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and verse 17. They have a responsibility to God for how they do that. And so they've got to take heed to themselves. Make sure first and foremost they're qualified and they're living right. They've got to feed the flock and they've got to try to lead them in the direction that Almighty God wants them to go. And you know a big part of what Paul puts the emphasis on in Paul's address to these elders is the Word of God. I want you to look at what he says to the elders in verse number 32. Paul says, So now, brethren, again, talking to the elders, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. How do we get built up spiritually today? How is Paul going to encourage these elders to be built up in the faith and to build others up? Well, friend, it's not from our own thinking. It's not from philosophy. It's not from the cute ideas or funny stories or anecdotes of men today. How are we built up spiritually? So now, brethren, I commend you to God 
and to the word of his grace. How do we make sure that we receive that, that heavenly inheritance? which is able to build you up, the Word of God, and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Do, do we see again the emphasis upon the power of God's Word? I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, Paul would say. It is the power of God unto salvation. That, that Word of God is living and powerful. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Uh, it's that, that, that sword. It's that hammer. It's that rock described in the Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah 22 verse number 29. And James said, we receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our soul. James chapter 1, verse number 21. And so in the Lord's church and in our lives as Christians, we want to give the word of God top priority. We want it to build us up, to encourage us, and we want to live by it to make sure that we indeed do have that heavenly home. Friend, I think too many times, if we're not careful, we can put the emphasis on, on human wisdom, on the thinking of men, and maybe some of the writing of men in books, and maybe what's popular today, and maybe what people would like to do. Friend, let's realize God's Word has the power to save us. It's still relevant today, Hebrews 4, verse 12, and it is the book we need to follow that is verbally inspired by Almighty God, 2 Timothy 3, verse number 16. Now, another powerful principle that we need to realize is that one of the things as we study about the gospel and as we study about the life of Christ, sometimes we get a, in another letter, we may get a glimpse into something that Jesus said that maybe isn't recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that is so powerful. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, we get a unique glimpse into one of those statements. I want you to notice something that Paul mentions the Lord is saying that we find unique to this passage. Paul says in verse number 35, as he speaks with these elders, he says, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Watch this now. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. This is a, a unique statement of Jesus recorded right here in Acts 20, verse 35. Our Lord said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. When did He say that? I don't know exactly when He said it, but I know when He said it. Now let me illustrate. That sounds a little contradictory, but here's what we mean by that. I don't know when it came out of His mouth, but friend, His whole life said it, did it not? Did not Jesus' life emphatically say it's more blessed to give than to receive. You look at his life. It was all about giving. He gave up heaven to come here. Second Corinthians 8 verse 9. He gave up the things in this life that he might could have called his own. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He was mocked. He was laughed at. He was uh, claimed to be working. People said he's got a demon in uh, Mark chapter 2 and 3. Uh, they ultimately spit on him. They beat him. They took him to a cross. And he hung there in agony and gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Listen to John 3, 16. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We know Jesus said it. Paul said he did. But his life speaks volumes to that idea itself. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Friend, what's that mean to our lives today? Life cannot be just about the individual. Life cannot be just about me and my selfish interest. If it's more blessed to give, to help others, to do good, than it is to take it in yourself, then we need to be givers in this life and not takers. Paul illustrates this in Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who lives. Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Friend, let's now take just a moment to turn our attention to some of Paul's statements in Acts chapters 21 and 22. And, and one of the ones that really stands out in Acts chapter 21 is Paul's statement in verse number 14. As Paul is recounting some of the things that has happened, as he knows there's going to be persecution that's upcoming, and as that is even prophesied about, how does Paul deal with that? Look at Acts 21 verse 14. Paul says these words, So when he would not be persuaded, 
That's Paul. They cease saying, the will of the Lord be done. It's prophesied. Persecution's coming. Don't go up here. Bad things are going to happen. And Paul says, wait a minute now. I've been called to preach the gospel. Don't try to stop me from doing that. I'm not going to stop preaching the gospel just because persecution might come. And so they gave up and they said, the will of the Lord be done. You know, it reminds us a lot of James chapter 4 and the problem that's going on in verses 13 through 17. Some are not saying, the Lord's will. They're going about and making plans, making business ventures, preparing for the future. None of that in and of itself wrong, but they have not said if it's the Lord's will. And these Christians say, even in the face of persecution, may the Lord's will be done. Friend, that's how our life, this is such a practical principle because that's how my life and yours needs to be lived each and every day, especially in the face of adversity and difficulty and challenges. Listen to Jesus in the garden. Matthew 26, Jesus is overwhelmed. No doubt with His impending suffering and persecution and death that's going to come. And He's in the garden praying. And His prayer is this, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now watch this. Not my will, but Thine be done. Friend, in this life, let's realize we're servants of God. Mark 10, verse 45. We've been called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, to live a life of service and sacrifice to God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If that's the case, that which needs to preface everything that goes in our life is, may the Lord's will be done. But do we often factor that in? You know, we factor our will. We factor others' will. We factor what we want. We factor what others want. We factor what would make people around us happy. But what about the Lord's will? That's the most significant thing in this life. And so may we strive every day to put the Lord's will as a top priority in our life. Now, moving on to Acts chapter 22. I I want you to hear as Paul is going to recount his conversion what Saul of Tarsus had to do to get from being outside of Christ and lost in sin to being in Christ where his sins were washed away. Notice the words of Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. The Bible records this. Ananias came to Saul and here's what he said. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, there are about three important things we want to emphasize from this text. The first is the great question asked. Why are you waiting? Saul, why are you waiting? Why are you waiting? Why am I waiting? Is there a danger to waiting? You bet there is. The Bible says we're not promised tomorrow. What's your life? It's but a vapor. Here for a little while, then it vanishes away. James 4, verse 14, we don't have promise of tomorrow. We need to say today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. And so don't put off till tomorrow what we can do today. Secondly, let's realize exactly when in time and when in obedience to the gospel, Paul's sins were washed away. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Friend, listen carefully. All of us realize that sin is what separates us from God, right? Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy, then He cannot hear. His, uh, ears not, his arms not short, then He cannot say. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin separates a man from God. If I can know exactly when sin is removed, in the plan of conversion, a plan of salvation, I can know exactly when a person's saved, right? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Friend, listen carefully. Baptism is the point in conversion when I contact the blood of Jesus that saves. Hebrews 9 verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. When do we contact the blood of Jesus and when do we receive that for the remission of sins? Repent and be baptized. 
every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Friend, the whole idea that's made up by men that baptism isn't essential and isn't necessary to be saved is foreign to the teaching of the Bible. And then a third principle is this. Oftentimes I will hear people who have the idea that all you've got to do to be saved is believe uh, use this, misuse this passage. Something like maybe Acts 2.21. They'll say, uh, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, friend, there's no doubt the Bible says that. But let's let the Bible define that for us. Listen again to Acts 22.16. Biblically, what does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Arise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, having called on the name of the Lord. How do you call on the name of the Lord? By getting up and doing what the Lord says to be saved. What does the Lord say? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. First Peter 3.21 3, says it this way. Baptism does now also save us, save us. Not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Friend, if baptism is when sins are washed away, and listen to it again, if baptism says, if the Bible says, baptism now saves us, how can anybody say baptism is an essential to salvation? Listen to the clarity with which Jesus spoke. Jesus said it so plainly. He that believes and is baptized, will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Did Jesus say, he that believes and is baptized will be saved? Sure. What if I believe only? No, nope, that isn't it. What if I'm baptized? I won't do it. Believe and be baptized to be saved. Listen to Jesus' words in John 3, verse 5. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is it essential to be baptized in water to enter into the kingdom of God and to go to heaven. And the Bible says absolutely. I know that may be foreign to what you've heard. I know that may be different than what others have taught. But friend, we just encourage you today to study these scriptures. See for yourself if these things are true. Is it the case Paul had to be baptized to have his sins washed away? And the Bible says he did. And so here's our plea to you today. Just like in Ephesus, just like in Corinth, just as Paul is preaching the gospel here to these people in Jerusalem and other places, so our appeal to you is, won't you obey the gospel plan of salvation? Hear the word, believe in it, repent of your sins, confess Jesus, and friend, just as Paul did, won't you arise and be baptized and have your sins washed away, calling on the name of the Lord? Our prayer and hope is that you'll do exactly that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.